If you have your Bibles, we ask you to turn to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 20. And as you're turning over there, uh, uh, we'll remind you we will have business meeting after church today. And the biggest thing I know of, and I'm prone to forget, so I'm sure there's other things, is if we're going to do a missions conference this year. Uh, so you pray about that, and we trust we'll know the Lord. All right, 2 Kings chapter 20 in the very first verse. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again. And tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord. The God of David thy father, have I heard the, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another day to be in your house, to meet with your people, God. We pray tonight, this morning, that you'd come down and that you would uh, fill the house with your presence, Lord, that you'd cause us uh, to be glad to be in the house of the Lord and that we'd rejoice in your word. Remember us, all, uh, remember us always, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight, uh, this morning, we'll be preaching on setting your house in order and also, to some extent, uh, accepting what God's plan is for your life. And, and one of the most dangerous things that we can anticipate or that we can be made to believe by the devil is that our way is better than God's way. You know why things are chaotic today? It's because men for generations have believed that their way is better than God's way. And that is never, ever the case. The way that this book teaches is always the very best. That's what we need to go with and what it ought to order our lives. Back in the first verse, the Bible says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Now, I want you to see that despite what may sound as a cruelty, God's plan for Hezekiah was that he would die. You, you know what? My, God's plan for me at some point is that I will die. That unless the Lord returns and, and intervenes in some bad way, that's God's plan for my life. And you know what? It's the penalty of sin. And we're going to face it. It's going to be part of our lives. But you know what? I, I've never known a more uh, a more uh, uh, false truth than that because we don't want to die. Uh, we almost see it as a punishment. We see it. We, we don't see. We see it as part of the devil's plan, not God's plan. But you know what? It is God's plan that we die. So Hezekiah kind of got off kilter here and um, made some mistakes that would go with Israel for generations. And, and so when God's plan comes your way, it is our plan, it, it ought to be our desire to accept it. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now, most people miss, I think, the, the emphasis of this message. He said, set thine house in order. Now, for the prophet to say that, what had to be the situation? That Hezekiah's house wasn't in order. That's the only conclusion you could come to, right? 
If the direction on death was set your house in order, we have to come to the conclusion that somehow, some way, that, uh, that Hezekiah's house wasn't in order. And, and what I personally believe, and like many kings of Israel, he had a real issue with making his children do. He had a real issue with raising his children up. He had a real issue with making his children mind and do and, and raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if you don't believe that, you look how Jeroboam turned out, and then you will believe. And, and, and so we find whatever the era was, that what needed to happen was that Hezekiah's house needed to be in order. Man, you know what, what he wants for us? He wants our house to be in order. He wants it to be as the Bible teaches a home ought to be. Set thine house in order. Now, I want, I want to go back very quickly uh, uh, with you and look at Genesis and hold your place there in Isaiah because we'll, I mean, in 2 Kings because we'll come back. Uh, 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 Genesis, uh, uh, Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Genesis 22 in verse 9. The Bible says this, and they, meaning Abraham and uh, Isaac, and they came to the place where God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. So there was a way to do this. There was a way to worship God, and there was a way not to worship him. And the way to worship him was in order. Now, I don't know if all the sticks had to be lined up uh, vertical or if they had to be lined up horizontal or there was a different way to do it like this but there was an order to God's worship and there always has been you know if, if you think about it you think about a lot of these Pentecostal churches and, and the worldly ones that are exploding like mushrooms you know what there's no order in that place <laughs> Uh, all it is is people screaming and hollering and flopping on the floor. Where's the order in that? It's just not there. And, and so we certainly, as the Lord's people, uh, we can get things out of order very quickly. You know, another thing you can uh, you you can think about is how order how orderly the the earth is around us very. Very recently, we had the beginning of fall, or the autumnal equinox. And, and, and you know what? Look at the trees outside the window this morning. Remember the last several nights, how cool they've been. We're transitioning into the fall of the year. And you know what? I'm 51 years old, and every year I've ever lived, this time of the year, it turns cooler. Why? Because we serve a God of order. We serve, we serve a God that puts everything in place and it always goes according to his will. And, and so certainly, if we serve a God of order, our lives should, should reflect that on a routine basis. It, it is an orderly thing. Now, if you will, go back to our text, 2 Kings chapter 20, uh, verse 2. Then he, meaning Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember. Now, I want you to notice two things. The, the fact that, that, if, uh, that he prayed wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know what? If somebody said, Larry, you're going to die, die in three or four days, you know what? I thought I'd do some praying too. But I want you to see the nature of Hezekiah's prayer was to change the will of God. You know what? That's not orderly. That, that, that's not what it ought to be. In fact, he says to God, the very, the very first word of his prayer had nothing to do with praise and lifting up the name of the Almighty God of heaven. He says, remember. Now, you know what? It's an impossibility for God to forget. So why would you tell him remember? Right? 
The only, the only conclusion I can draw is maybe Hezekiah didn't know his character like, like he thought he did. Maybe he, his relationship with the Almighty wasn't as intimate as it ought to be if he did not even know the very base things concerning the nature of God. Remember, O oh God, and again, that's an impossibility he can't forget. Re, uh, uh, I beseech thee, O oh Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. Now, I want you to see another thing. He makes a little bit of a lie here. I walk before you perfect. You know what? There's one man that's done that, and that, that is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody did that. He, he wasn't perfect. You know what? Hezekiah was no perfect, more perfect than I am. And so he makes these bold claims that are not even true. Have you ever thought maybe that's why the prophet Isaiah came by and said, uh, set your house in order because you're going to die. Because you know what? If we really get our house in order, we know we're like some of the earth right down here. And apparently that's kind of believe that. He believed he was okay. Man, I serve the Lord. No, that is not the nature of man. And so there was no humility in the life of Hezekiah as he's trying to barter with the Almighty. Verse 3, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight, and Hezekiah wept sore. Now, again, I don't think the weeping was necessarily a bad thing. You know what? One day, when it comes down to the end of, of our life, we're going to be doing some weeping too. But you know what? I, I have to believe this. Number one, if you're truly born again, you're going to have a peace about death. And number two, if you, set, if you served him like you should, there's going to be a peace to come out of that. Uh, not that you're a big eye, and not like Hezekiah, oh, I've served you, and you know, like nobody else has ever served you. No, no, that you've been a servant, that you've been a minister, that you've tended to the things of God the very best you know how. You know what? I think with that comes a great deal of peace. And uh, apparently uh, Hezekiah just didn't have it. He didn't, he didn't have the nearness that he ought to, so he's weeping before God. Now, notice what happens then. And it came to pass, verse 4, and it came to pass before I, Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord. Uh, the God of David, thy father, hath heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice another thing here. Uh, some people say that his prayer changed God's heart. No, no. You, you know what happened in Hezekiah's life right at this point? That's why I want you to be careful what you pray for. He went from the will of God to the permissive will of God. In other words, God said, okay, if that's what you want, take it. And you, you know why I believe that? Three years later, he bore Jeroboam, and that was the worst man that ever approached the throne of Israel. See, if he just went ahead and accepted it and, and, and took the will of God, as difficult it may be, and died, Jeroboam would never existed. And, and so Hezekiah, Hezekiah's life was not in order. <clears throat> Apparently, he was a lot higher on the totem pole than he thought he was. <laughs> and he thought he deserved something from God. You know what you deserve from God to be cast out in the middle of the fiery pits of hell? That's what we deserve. On the merit of Christ, we're saved. Not on your merit. And, and you know, that's why I can't understand these works for salvation, folks, because, huh, you know what? They don't. They they put God even with them, and, and collectively they're trying to save you. How foolish can you be? Hezekiah, Hezekiah's house wasn't in order 
And it was proven by two things. Number one, his willful prayer to go against the plan of God. And secondly, the man that he bore, Jeroboam, it proved that his home was not in order. You know whose fault that was, man? It was, it was Hezekiah's fault. It wasn't the fault of God. It, it, it wasn't the fault of even Jeroboam in that sense. He didn't have his house in order. You know another one that did not? David. David let his children run the show. You know what? If we ever do that as people, if you do that as a home unit and let your children be in control, you've got a big issue as things go down the road a little bit. And so we see as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know there is an order that it ought to be in a godly home every day. Now, I want you to look in Genesis chapter 4. I mean, excuse me, Genesis chapter 1, and, and see the nature of our God. And I know all of you know this, but I think it's good to be reminded of it sometimes. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 1, and, uh, verses 4 and 5. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God div div uh, divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, if you know the story, the truth of creation, every day had an assignment. And every day God did that assignment that he accomplished, and he accomplished the work. You know, that's like these yahoos, it says it's just boom, and, and out of chaos came order, that's foolish. You know, it's just like I said, we're going through the fall of the year right now. We just began that. You know what? That's not chaos. That's order. Every year it happens just this way. And how could the, the wonderful, marvelous universe that we're in learn to rotate and move about out of chaos? It don't even make sense. He is a God of order. And we should reflect that. You know why women like to run around in breeches? Because it gets things out of order. They look like men. And, and everybody get you know, you're so tore up when you see a man in a dress. Well, my question for you is what's the difference? What's the difference? You know what? Uh, happened, it began to happen at the end uh, of the Great Depression in the war, uh, the Second World War, when Rosie the River went down and wore her britches to the factory in the war effort. It never changed again. You know what that is? It's putting it out of order. It's out of God's order, is it not? And, and, and we, we crave the presence of the Almighty, and our lives are out of order, just as Hezekiah's was in that day. We serve a God of order. Drop down to verse eight, and God called, uh, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So up above us, even today, the, to me, uh, there are three heavens according to the Bible, because uh, the Bible says that uh, uh, Paul was caught up into the third heaven, which is the abode of God. Right now, the sky is pretty out there. It's, uh, it was kind of cloudy this morning. Uh, it's kind of burning off a little bit out there, and we see some clouds and some blue sky. We see the sun uh, coming down. That's the first heaven. After that is the atmospheric heaven, the wonderful stars that we see on a clear, pretty night. And above that is the abode of God. You know what that is? Layer by layer, that's order. It is just as orderly as it can be. Neat, precise, everything in its place. <coughs> You know, uh, we need to understand what our place is in getting it. We need to understand what God's purpose for our life is and get into that place and do it the very best you can. And why? Because it's order. It's exactly what God designed from the beginning. It needs to be very, very orderly according to the word of God. Verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, and, uh, and the gathering together waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good. 
Now, what did he see about the dividing out and the creation of land? He said it was good. You, you know what an orderly home is where daddy's doing his job and mama's doing her job and the kids are in their places? It's good. It's very, very good. And when you have anything less, you have, you, you know what, you know, and I, I specifically attribute it to this. Most people don't realize this. You know, the, the divorce rate in our nation tripled in the 20 years following the, the Second World War. And you know why? Things were out of order. Mama could work, work and make just as much as much as daddy. Why does she need daddy? Right? Things were out of order. And you know what? Here in the day that we live today, what we have is utter chaos because nothing is in order. You know why men are marrying men? Because there's nothing in order. You know, you, you know why uh, the economy collapsed around us? There's nothing in order. You know why this virus, and listen, I understand that it's real, but listen, don't you believe a CNN news that it's as bad as they say it? You know what that created in our country? Chaos. It broke the order. And, and, and we're still recovering from that. And, and we as the Lord's people... We need to, it ought to be the, the nature of the saved man to crave this order that God has ordained. Uh, Genesis 2.2, 2, and we'll leave this. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which was made, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And so we find that now let me say this this was just teaching us order you know what god didn't need to rest <laughs> he spoke this place into being just like i'm preaching a message and, and he wasn't wore out and tired and, man uh, uh, that, that about killed me yeah. he was teaching us order Amen. just teaching us order uh, and that's why the Lord's Day is what it is today. That order still remains. And you know, I, I was reading this article, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but I assume it was. Um, the, I think the Japanese, or no, it's the Chinese, was wanting to go to a 10-day calendar to be on the metric system, as opposed to a 7-day calendar. And they tried her for a while, and they literally had people jumping out of windows, falling dead on the blind. And the reason why, things were out of order. They were giving their life instead of, uh, instead of just boom, 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 boom. You, you know what that happened? It's out, it out of God's order. You know what I said when I read it? It's a wonder more of them didn't kill themselves than they did. Because it's out of God's order. And anytime we get anything out of God's order, we are at risk. And, and we all know what the Bible says. Uh, the soul that sinneth, what? Yeah. It shall die. And they certainly did, did they not? Could you imagine being in such a state of misery uh, that you would prefer death over life? Well, you, you, you get further enough from the order of God and you'll find out what it's about. You, you, it will sound like a pretty good idea for you. Now, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. I mean, excuse me, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. 11. I just want to read three verses here. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, the very first verse. The Bible says this, Be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Now, the first thing we find here, it, it is a it, it is a piece of the order. Unless your pastor's doing something out of this, outside this book, you know what you need to do? You need to follow him. You need, you need to listen to his advice. You need to do, as a unit, as a 
church ought to be, do follow what he would have us to do. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Now let me intersect here who's he who's he's writing to. And that was the church of Corinth, right? And, and so we believe he was he was writing to save people because you know what? Uh, Christ is not the head of the lost. Right. Yeah. Remember what he said? He said, uh, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew. No. And so when you compare yourself to others, be sure you're comparing yourself to godly men. Uh, you know what? The world's going to look good. They're going to have more fun. They're going to have more money. Uh, so when you begin to look for comparisons, don't look out there, look in here. And, and, and make your comparisons justly so. Otherwise, you'll be making mistakes. And so remember that he's addressing saved people. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So God, Christ, man, woman. Now you talk about getting some people stirred up in most places, and in this church I would say is generally the exception of the rule. But you know what? It comes down to this, that the man is the head of the home, and if there is a disagreement, what the man says goes. Yeah. Not real popular preaching in 2020, is it? But it's still the truth. Now, man, if we're not careful, like, man, <laughs> it's going to go my way or the highway, right? Just remember you're responsible. With, with that with that authority comes responsibility. And it is definitely the man's responsibility. But man, just be sure that with that authority, you're not abusing it. And just know this. That this is the most humbling thing because sometimes I can be a little light and uh, especially looking at Bella sometime. Uh, you know, I'm 50, soon be 52 years old and having a child like this again. It, it, it's a big challenge. And, and, and punishing them and, and, and guiding them that, uh, the way that I did my older children is it, very, very difficult. But you know what? It's not an excuse. I was standing accountable. She's mine, and I don't care if I'm 152. You need to be the parent you ought to be. You ever thought about the children that Abraham had out of the will of God? We, we all know uh, uh, the oldest one and how he opposed uh, how he po opposed uh, Esau the way that he did. I mean, Esau opposed uh, uh, the other son the way that he did. But do you ever think about the other six? All the four sons, I mean, the six sons of Keturah. I believe he was in his 150s when those kids were born. Every one of them a rebellious nation against Israel. Their whole existence. And you know why? Number one, it was out of God's plan. But, you know, number two is this. He wasn't a good father to those children. He wasn't saying, okay, and I can't even remember any of their names, uh, Benadad, you're going to toe the line because I said so. Edom, get your act together. I'm going to bust you good. You know why? Probably, number one, he wasn't able. He was old. And number two, he didn't take the time to do it. Now, when Jacob and Esau were young, uh, he, had, he had Esau, and I believe he raised him right, the best he knew, and then here comes Jacob 13 years later, and he's working with him, and then all this time later, he has six more. You know what? 
He was responsible for all eight of them. He was responsible for every one of them. So man just remember with that authority comes responsibility and then the last thing I'll say on this and we'll move on just because you don't do it don't mean you're not responsible you know uh, you, you, think, you think about the judgment uh, of the almighty and, and a few examples that we have there in the scriptures and one of them said did I not prophesy in thy name and he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And so they were accountable. You see what I'm saying? Um, we're accountable for our children, every one of them. Every one of them, we are accountable in how they're raised, what the response is. And you know what? Then we're done. And we ought to praise God that he's given those gifts to us and not be upset about it. Now, I want to go very quickly back to 2 Samuel, this time in chapter 11. Uh, 2 Samuel 11. Probably one of the most famous stories of the life of David, sadly enough. 2 Samuel chapter 11, in the very first verse. The Bible says that it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, the first, and you know the story of Uriah and, and Bathsheba and David but I want you to see the very first thing that got him into his trouble, men, was excusing himself from duty. You know what your duty is, man? To bring those kids to the house of God, to train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord all the days of their life. That, that you know, we think, we're, and I, I've seen some preachers raise their children this way at 18, they kind of unhook the boat. Where do you find that in Scripture? I don't think it's fair to you. Uh, my boys still come and ask me for advice today, and they're 28 and 30. And you know, the best way I understand the Scripture, I'm still responsible for that. Uh, you know, you, you know, you look at a 30-year-old son and have to say, I don't think that's the best idea. Everybody thinks it gets easier. Listen, I'll tell you this, it gets harder. Because you know what? They have their own, own set of mentality there. But, you know, as the old saying goes, don't ask if you don't want to know. But I, I am the responsible person for them even today. I have to give them sound advice. And I, I, I've seen some preacher man raise their kids at 18 and whoever came up with that, I don't know. But uh, uh, just cut them off. You, do, you know what an 18-year-old is going to do? They're going to live like a dog. because that's, Unless they're saved, that's their nature. That's the worst time in a man's life you can cut him off to his own self. And, and, and so we find then that we are to uh, we are to be in our place, man. Verse 2, And it came to pass in the evening time that David rose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired of the woman... And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of, the, of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent a messenger and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, at, for she was purified from the uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, I want you to see how quickly progressive sin is. Now, we think that, you know, uh, maybe we could wait out a little way and, and rush back. But I want you to see that David went from looking to doing it to acting on the sin in three verses. You know what? You, you will be involved in that sin that quick. Do not trust this flesh. Do not 
trust its capabilities. It has no spiritual value at all. And, and, and so we find then that he he runs on this, he, he commits this sin, and very natural his own child came out of it. Now he's in double trouble, and he begins to think like a lost man. Verse 15, the Bible says, and when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong verse. Uh, verse 11, and Uriah said unto David, the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of the Lord are camped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house and eat and, and to drink and lie with my wife? So thou live, so as thou livest, and as my soul liveth, I will do not such a thing. So I want you to see that Uriah's uh, morality was greater than David's. Verse 15. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Send ye Uriah the, uh, in the forefront of the battle against, uh, in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Now, for you to get the full, the full uh, message of this, the very one carrying the letter for the death sentence was the man that was going to be killed. You know what? That's a pretty messed up man that would do that. Uh, and that's where sin will get you. you. You know what? You know what? Now. David's home is out of order and his life is out of order too. Man, you know what? Your life's going to get out of order if you're not careful and then your home's going to be in a real mess. And it, it, it's a difficult thing in the modern day because you know what we always do instead of comparing ourselves to this book, we compare ourselves to the world, do we not? You know what? I can assure you of this easily. The world's going to have a better home than you do. It's going to have better cars than you do. And, and it, it's going to have, uh, and, and, they're, and they're going to have nicer things than you. And you know why? This is their land. You are a pilgrim and a stranger. And lost people, <laughs> you, you know what? You, you know what about pilgrims and strangers and we're more waters, we're moving on? When you're moving on, you don't you you don't need a whole lot of stuff, and if you have it, you know what? It's going to slow you down. And so, don't don't compare yourself to the Joneses because you know what? The Joneses is always going to come out on top, and you're going to look like you don't have too much. But so let it be, because uh, God knows it. Uh, now we brought down to verse twenty-six, Second Samuel eleven, verse twenty-six. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning were, was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and married him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, I want you to name, notice two things. First of all, and I believe this is sincere, it says of Bathsheba that she mourned Uriah. You know what? I may be as wrong as two left feet, but I don't think I am. I don't believe I don't believe Bathsheba was in, involved with this a bit. You know what? If we understood kingship and monarchies, and he says you're going to do this, she didn't have much of a choice. So don't blame Bathsheba. And you know what? When her husband died, I believe her mourning was sincere. That she was very sorry that her husband had been killed. And if I under those stand that scripture correctly, she didn't even know what David had done. She thought he was killed in battle. She, she thought that it was just uh, uh, another event in, in the battle for the Lord. And so they tried to cover their sin. But I want you to see the Bible says this, but the thing displeased the Lord. Have you ever thought about why... <laughs> Why David seemed so blessed when there was so much sin in his life? It wasn't because David was good. He made a promise to the nation of Israel. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't because David was such a great man. 
The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But this thing, when, when God makes a promise, he'll keep it. But that, don't make you're, that doesn't mean you're doing everything you need to do. That doesn't mean you're as near to God as you ought to be. But you know what? He's going to keep his promises. He, um, because anything less would be outside his nature. And so then, I want you to go with me to chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible says this, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Now remember, he gives this parable. David doesn't get it because he's cold and indifferent to the things of God. So Nathan has to lay it on the line and say, You know what? You're the one with the problem. And Nathan, sa and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I will deliver thee out of the hand. I, I have delivered thee. Excuse me. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I have gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bo bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that was too little, uh, I would have moreover have given unto you the, these such and such things. Wherefore thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord and has killed and has and the, the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. Why did you do that? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, thou hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now for now therefore the sword will never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Now I want you to see something interesting. He says thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. He didn't say the opposing enemy did. He says you did. You know what? Even if we just suggest something that's evil and people follow it, you're still responsible, not them. You're the one responsible. So I ask you, men, ladies, where are you at? Are you where you need to be? Is the spot where God would have you to be? Have you ever pondered why, why do we struggle so much? Well, first of all, is your home in order? And secondly, if your home is in order, are you serving it? See, we need to reflect the order of God, do we not? Our, our church needs to reflect the order of God. Now, I don't think it's necessarily a wrong thing, but you know what the Bible gives as offices of the church? It gives you a pastor, it gives you deacons, it gives you elders, and it gives you teachers, that's it. You know, when uh, we were at Bumper Smells, we always had, I don't know, that job where people go up and read prayer requests, uh, Sunday school superintendent, is that what it's called? And uh, where did they come up with that? I didn't tell you where they came up with it, it's from Southern Baptist. <laughs> uh, you find that in the scriptures? And we won't go too deep in there, but you saw what happened with that, don't you? You know what that happened? It's out of God's will. It wasn't his plan. Uh, we didn't need a man to come in and preach two sermons, did we? And you, again, you saw how that ended up. But there's an order to God's things, and we need to be in our place. We need to say, yes, it's going to be this way, and no, that it's not. And we can, or we can't. But that don't excuse you from accountability. We, we need to be doing about the Father's business.